Hi, welcome to today's Science Story Time. I'm Allison with the Rochester Museum and Science Center. Thanks for joining me today. Today our Science Story Time has a little bit of a historical twist. Our story today is called The Erie Canal. This story is really fun because it combines the lyrics of an old time Erie Canal song called Low Bridge Everybody Down with some really beautiful illustrations and drawings by Peter Spire. The Erie Canal. Illustrated by Peter Spire. I've got an old mule and her name is Sal. 15 miles on the Erie Canal. She's a good old worker and a good old pal. 15 miles on the Erie Canal. We've hauled some barges in our day, filled with lumber, coal, and hay. And every inch of the way we know, from Albany to Buffalo. Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, for now we're going through a town. You can always tell your neighbor, you can always tell your pal. If you ever navigated on the Erie Canal. We better get along on our way, old gal, 15 miles on the Erie Canal. You bet your you bet your life I'd never part with sail. Fifteen miles on the Erie Canal. Get up there, mule. Here comes a lock. We'll make Rome about six o'clock. So one more trip and then we'll go. Right straight back to Buffalo. Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, for we're going through a town. You can always tell your neighbor, you can always tell your pal. If you've ever navigated on the Erie Canal. The end. The Erie Canal was an engineering marvel in the 19th century that really opened up western New York and the western part of the United States to improvements in agriculture and travel, really opening up society. Um, and the best thing about the Erie Canal is it went right through Rochester, right down the street from where the Rochester Museum and Science Center is. This Erie Canal actually traveled across an aqueduct, this really cool engineering feat that carried the canal over the Genesee River. Stick around because we're going to learn more about what makes boats float, including those that traveled on the Erie Canal. In our story today, the Erie Canal, we followed the story of a packet boat going up and back along the Erie Canal from Albany to Buffalo. I love learning about the Erie Canal because it's a geography lesson, a history lesson, and an engineering lesson kind of all rolled into one. The Erie Canal first began construction in 1817 and it took over eight years to complete. And when it finally opened in 1825, historically, it was a really important moment, not only for the city of Rochester, one of the cities along the canal, but for the state of New York and for the United States. The Erie Canal was really important because for the first time, the Western states had access to a shipping port on the Atlantic Ocean. As we know, the Erie Canal ran from Albany which is right here in New York State, Albany, all the way like this, passing Syracuse and Rome, Rochester, Lockport, Spencerport, and making its way all the way to Buffalo. The completion of the canal connected the Great Lakes, specifically Great Lake Erie, with the Mohawk and Hudson Rivers, and then all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean through the port in New York City. This was important because for the first time, we were able to ship goods and move people from the eastern part of the country into the western part. What this did is it reduced shipping costs 
by up to 10% and reduce the shipping time by close to 50%. This was really important. It opened up the consumer economy. Rochester became a boom town. People were buying and selling grain, moving, you know, flour. We are the flour city and being able to ship and transport goods more cheaply. Additionally, the Erie Canal was historically important and played an active role in the Underground Railroad. If you make your way to the second floor at the Rochester Museum and Science Center, you'll see our Flight to Freedom exhibit. One of the highlighted stories there is about Thomas James, an escaping slave from the South who used the planned path of the Erie Canal to find his way north to Canada and escape slavery in the South. Historically, now we know that the Erie Canal was really important for our country and for Rochester. But next, let's talk a little bit more about the engineering feat and how it was one of the most amazing engineering and design challenges of the 19th century. Building the Erie Canal proved to be such a difficult task that many people didn't believe it could actually happen. It was referred to as Clinton's Folly or Clinton's Ditch, referencing New York State Governor at the time, DeWitt Clinton, who initiated the project. But after eight years of hard work, the canal finally opened in October of 1825. It was 363 miles long, 40 feet wide, and four feet deep. Can you imagine digging a hole that big? Especially in the 1800s without the heavy machinery that we have today, this was a very impressive feat. Not only were the engineers and builders of the Erie Canal digging this giant hole without machinery, they faced another challenge. In the way of the path of the future canal were trees and forests. This was the 1800s in New York State. The land was covered in trees. So what they had to do before they could even start digging was cutting down the trees. Once they were able to do that though, they realized that they didn't have a tool or anything to help them remove the stumps that were left behind. What they ended up inventing was a stump puller. You can try your hand at inventing a stump puller in the RMSC's Inventor Center up on the third floor. This machine used simple machines and horsepower to remove the stumps that were in the way of the canal. The next big challenge that the engineers and builders faced was the topography in the geography of New York State. If you turned a map of New York State flat and looked at it from the side, well, the map would be flat. In real life, though, there's high points and low points, hills and valleys, swamps, and steep inclines. So how would you build a canal to go uphill, the elevation of the Erie Canal between Albany and Buffalo actually increases over 570 feet. That's a big increase. In order to accomplish this task, the builders and engineers used locks. We're not talking about locks like the kind you use to lock your door or your car that you have a key. These locks were essentially like water elevators that helped a boat move along the canal in lifting it or lowering it to different points along the way. As boats, passenger boats, which were called packet boats, they were a flat bottomed boat on the canal. They would often carry up to 100 passengers. As they, or boats that carried freight or goods, came up to a lock, a set of doors would open. The boat would then be pulled into this chamber. The doors would be closed behind it. The lock master would then fill this chamber with water lifting the boat to the next level and having it move along its journey. The original Erie Canal had 83 locks built into it. If you want to try your hand at being a lock master, next time you're at the RMSC, check out the Adventure Zone exhibit where we have a model of two different Erie Canal locks so you can try your hand at being a lock master. For our activity today, we're going to experiment and design different types of boats out of aluminum foil and do our best to figure out why boats float, even when they're loaded with passengers and goods like the packet boats and the freight boats were when they traveled on the Erie Canal. For this experiment today, what you're gonna need are some simple materials you can find around your house. A roll of aluminum foil, you'll need three pieces. Towels, because we are using water. A big bowl or a container that you can fill with water big enough so that your boats will fit into it. Raid your piggy bank, find some pennies or maybe washers, something that you can add as equal weights to your boats. And then 
Just a notepad and pencil to record your results and make some observations along the way. As you know, boats come in a variety of sizes and shapes. Today for our experiment, we're gonna make three different boats using aluminum foil. What you're gonna to wanna to do when you design each of your three boats, pull out a piece of aluminum foil, rip it off. When I make mine, I like to fold it in half because I feel like it makes it a little bit more durable to work with. First, we're gonna make a flat bottom boat because I think they're probably the easiest to make. There's no right or wrong way to design your boat. But as you do it, work with the aluminum foil to design a boat that you think will float in your glass container full of water. Make sure that before you even start adding pennies that your boats float. We'll give this one a shot here. So that's how I would make a flat bottom boat. Let's see. Give it a quick test here. Yep, my flat bottom boat floats. Next you'll wanna make a boat that has a pointed bottom. These ones can be a little trickier to make because you do have to figure out their balance. This one here has a nice pointed ridge along the bottom. We'll test that one next. And then you're gonna to wanna to make a rounded boat. This one you can kinda of see is just curved and rounded right on the bottom. And we'll test that one third. Next for your experiment, you wanna take your pennies Grab a handful, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna place pennies into your boat one at a time until your boat sinks. So we'll just start adding one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Can you stop? 70, 71, 72, 73. You can start to see my flat bottom boat is filling with water. It's 74, 75, 76, ah, 77, 78 pennies to make my flat bottom boat sink. You're gonna repeat this experiment with both the pointed bottom and the rounded bottom boat. Don't forget to record your results. So my flat bottom boat was 78. How many pennies will it take to sink your boat? Feel free to share your results with me. I'd love to see how your experiments turned out. But the big question we have yet to answer today is why do boats float? That is a great question. Boats float because as they are pressed into the water, the water in that surrounding area is pushed away to make room for the boat. This is called displacement. The water around the boat pushes back on the sides and the bottom of the boat, helping to keep it afloat. It was Archimedes who first introduced us to this principle, and he said that if the weight of the object being placed in the water is less than the weight of the water, the object will float. This is what we call buoyancy and is one of the main reasons why boats float. In our experiment today, in the version that I did with my three boats, the flat bottom boat designed after the packet boats in the Erie Canal held the most number of pennies, 78. My pointed bottom boat only held 35 and the rounded bottom boat only held 66 pennies. The flat bottom boat had the, probably the simplest design but it was really efficient because it actually helped distribute the weight of the pennies across the bottom of the boat. Thanks so much for joining me today for Science Story Time and for sticking around to learn a little bit about the Erie Canal and why boats float. I'm Allison with the Rochester Museum and Science Center and I hope to see you next time. And until then, don't forget, you'll always know your neighbor, you'll always know your pal if you've ever navigated on the Erie Canal. Hi everybody, it's Allison with the Rochester Museum and Science Center. Just a quick update on Science Storytime. I wanted to let you know that next week's Science Storytime is gonna be brought to you by my friend Angie, our Environmental Education Coordinator at the Coming Nature Center. You'll be seeing more of her in the next couple of weeks too.